Welcome to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. I mean, Smithy, we're lucky we're doing this on a Thursday because I tell you what, I needed a bit of a rest after the weekend, mate. It was absolute <laughs> chaos. Oh, just from the, the Sunday match, Kempi. I think we all needed a little bit of a breather. Put the feet up for 24 hours and just get over what had happened. But what a what a cracking start to the final series for 2022. Couple of absolutely, uh, couple of ups, upsets maybe. In, in some people's eyes, some upsets. Others probably thinking, no, no, I back that. I back that team. I back Canberra to go down there and beat the Storm. Oh. Oh, no. I'm out. Oh, I'm out. Oh, no. Oh, he's gone. He's done. That's Take what's over. broken him. <laughs> Finally, it's broken him. We've got the great Smithy. We've broken him. He's there out the first week. Uh, mate, uh, it was, you're totally right. It was an incredible weekend of footy. Welcome to all our <laughs> listeners. However you're tuning in, 1170 on SCN, 1620 on the Goldie, 5, uh, 1053 in Brizzy. Uh, Queensland listeners listening via SENQ on DAB+. Plus. Or if you're listening live on the SEN app, make sure to download the SEN app at the App Store or the Google Play Store. Or you can listen belatedly on Apple and Spotify. You just go to the Captain's Run, you hit subscribe, and boom, you can listen to us anytime. You can go back and look at old episodes, everything. But on today's show, we're going to break down all the recent news, Rugby League. We've got the finals week two preview, plus your texts and your call. So give us a call on 1300 01 1170, and you can ask me all of your footy questions or give us a text 0457 736 736. Now, I mean, let's just get a quick wrap of the games on the weekend. So, obviously, we had the Penny Panthers getting the job done over the years. Mm -hmm. I don't think the... I mean, look, the score does, I think, reflect a, a dominant Panthers. But the Eels were quite dominant for the first half. They, 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 Cleary came out and really came alive in that second half. Then mm -hmm. we had the, uh, the absolute blockbuster in the Cowboys versus the Sharkies. Yep. And holy, that was an incredible... When you talk about high-quality footy mixed in with that... Um, I guess, fatigue factor and mental toughness. Mm -hmm. Amazing stuff. Uh, I mean, the, the games on the weekend were of the, the highest standard. Even, look, I, I would say the roosters Rabbitohs wasn't the highest standard, but mm -hmm. it was one of the most exciting games I've ever watched. Smithy, how did you kind of feel across the board in regards to the <clears throat> week one finals footy? Yeah, well, they each had their own sort of narrative, wasn't it, at the, at the end of the, the match? And, and no game was sort of the same style of footy. Um, it, when you think about... You know, the first game that we watched on the weekend, Penrith v uh, the Eels, like, as you mentioned, Kepi, up at half time, it was one point, the difference. So Mitch Moses goes for a field goal, misses. Penrith get an opportunity to go down the other end and then Cleary slots it. And, and they go into the sheds at half time at 7-6. So you're thinking, well, like, what a what a match we've got in our hands. And it's what everyone expected. Parramatta were the only team in the competition that had beaten the Panthers twice um, throughout the regular games. So a lot of people are actually saying, well, this is, this is the game where Parramatta can knock Penrith off and, and jag a, a, a preliminary final, a grand final qualifier. But they just, what Penrith did and what they've done so well over the past, you know, two seasons, I believe, with the style of footy that they're playing, they just, they just got themselves into a real grindy style of football in the second half. And just what they did was they, they just, they made Parramatta break. Now, I know they had the um, – Mitch Moses went off uh, with a head knock and that really sort of hurt their chances, I believe. I thought, you know, he was playing some pretty good football up to that point, particularly his kicking. I thought it it, uh, it was turning Penrith around a lot. It was putting a lot of pressure um, on Dylan Edwards and, and their wingers when he, he, he kicked a lot of – a couple of early ones and put it on the ground and just made it uncomfortable for Penrith. But when he went off, they just – they lost their way a little bit, Parramatta, so – um, they, they, just on that, just on that Smitty, yeah. what are your thoughts on, you know, Jacob Arthur? He was carried on the bench, and it's a really interesting selection because mm. I, I understand all the baggage that comes with it. It's father, son, rara. But I want to talk more specifically about the footy selection. Yep. Now, Jacob Arthur, he's a seven and only a seven. Mm -hmm. And even when he's coming on the field, surely Dylan Brown is the main guy, even with yeah. Arthur coming on the field. And I just think that selection was really surprising like why why wouldn't you carry a guy like Bryce Cartwright who can come on and play six and then Brown can come seven but Cartwright can also play a bunch of different I just I was a bit unsure about that selection what are your thoughts on the fact that they had a specific seven on the bench well maybe maybe Jacob Arthur can play a little bit of nine as well like okay. we're not sure like we, we don't know yeah. we're not at training maybe he does a little bit of training a little bit of preparation to play nine so if anything was to happen to Reed Marnie he can fill that void as well because mm. like a lot of clubs take a utility player 
yeah. someone that can play you know, multiple positions, particularly um, can go in and play nine. Um, you know, like the Panthers, they have two nines. Yep. Um, uh, so does Canberra. So does Melbourne. Um, and and so maybe maybe Jake Arthur can play a little bit of nine if he has to. Um, but I'll, that, that's the one thing I was a little bit surprised with. Not this, not so much the selection, Kempi, was when Mitch Moses went off. I, I just feel as though you know Dylan Brown needed to st- step up a little bit. Mm. And it was it was almost he had a very quiet game by his standards. I didn't. Mm. I'm not saying he played poorly, but he had a he had a quite a, a quiet game um, to his standards. So, look, I, I'm sure that you know he's reviewed his own match and and as has every Parramatta player, um, and they know that now it's it's do or die. So they've burnt mm. their they've burnt their chance. Um, it's gone. Um, so they need to make this next performance count if they if they're going to go forward in the competition. And, and what did you think about Cleary's performance? You know, obviously there, there's the the rave reviews, and we all agree. You know, the prince is back, and he, he didn't. You were right. You predicted. You didn't feel he did need any warm up games. Mm-hmm. He was going to be good to go. I, I personally felt the first half he was solid, really strong kicking. Yep. But I thought it took him about 40 minutes to realise. You know, I need to start running the ball. What Cleary's mm-hmm. performance? Where do you kind of feel? Is he primed and ready for a big? you know, push into the grand final, do you think? Yeah, well, I think he is, mate. I really do. And uh, we, we spoke about this when, um, what, six weeks ago when he was suspended, or six and a half weeks ago now, when he was suspended for that tackle on, on Dylan Brown um, against Parramatta. And just saying, like, oh, I really felt that this would, it would be almost a, a positive, not just for Nathan, but for that entire Penrith squad that that he was going to spend some time away from that team. Um, you know, just for the games, he's obviously training with them every day, but they're going to go out and play some footy without Nathan, who is their he is their key man. Mm. He is the player that that um, is central to their entire game plan. You you can see with the way they play. Now they've got some great individual players that can come up with you know their own brilliance at times, but their their game plan is based all around Nathan. Mm. Um, and but that and that's the thing that he's so strong at. That's the strongest part of his game. Like he's not a. He's not a player that plays a lot of um, instinctive football, although he, he he can at times. But the way he base he bases his game ninety five percent of his game is based on a system and a structure that he builds um, with his squad during the week and with mm. the coaches. And so the, his his strong point of his game though, Kempi, is that so anytime he gets the ball, he's got three or four options. So he can pass short, he can pass out the back, he can pass on his inside, or he can run the football, or he can kick. Mm. So there are his options. And then what he does is, his greatest ability is when he gets the ball, when he looks up and sees his defense, whatever whatever uh, picture he looks at defensively, that then says, okay, that's the play I put on. Mm. And And so what he was so good at on the weekend was he didn't overplay his hand early, as you said. He kicked strongly. There's no doubt about that. He put Wonga Blake under all, <laughs> oh my all sorts God. of, and we I could probably. Not missed four I was going to say we could probably touch on that quickly with you being a winger, but, but, but as he got into the game and they started building a bit more momentum through the middle, the Parramatta defence started getting a little bit more fatigued. That's when he seen options to run, and you know he come up with a, a couple of nice little plays towards the end of the game there, where he where he, set, he ended up setting up a try when he he touched the ball like three consecutive tackles in a row, but um, it was just a. I guess the thing that that made his performance stand out more was because he'd been away for so long, and mm. and I don't think many people sort of expected him to come back and play that well. But you got to understand, this is this is one of the one of the elite players of the competition, and he's not someone that if he's not playing is just going to sit there and do nothing. He would have had himself. He, he would have trained more. Put it this way, he would have trained. I reckon more often and longer and harder than what he would have if he was playing, mm. if you understand that. It's yeah. because he was able to. He's not getting yeah. banged up. He's not getting hit around on the weekend. So he took the time to get in the gym, which he hasn't had a lot of opportunity to over the last 12 months because of that shoulder injury. So he would have been in the gym. He would have been getting strong. He would have been getting fit. And, and he just would have come out feeling fresh and, and just really good about himself last week. Mate, he, he looks... So sharp, and you're right, he didn't miss a beat. I, as I said, I was a bit concerned. I was like, I just think he might need a game. But you're absolutely right. And in regards to the training, it's almost, um, it's 
when you're in a squad and you're in the rehab, it's yep. almost a bit of a punishment. It's almost <laughs> it feels like, like that. Hey? It feels like it, even though it's not. But like they it's kind of like if you're in rehab, we are going to absolutely tear you up. For, I mean, for mm. a couple of reasons, we don't you don't want to be in rehab. No, but also you need to be even fitter than you were before because you've got an opportunity here to work on things like your cardio, whether it's your body strength. Mm. Um, always improving, and clearly did that. In regards to Wonga Blake, yeah, look, really, really tough night. I, I will say, in Wonga Blake's defence, and uh, although I think you know, as a winger, you've got to do your job, and unfortunately, he he didn't. Um, he hasn't played that much wing. You know, mm-hmm. he's mainly been a centre. Yep. It's 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 interesting because it doesn't really get, I guess, talked about as much as I think it probably should, and that's probably because I'm a winger. But those catching those high balls, that's a specialty. That that is not. It is not an easy task, and no. I, I think some fans don't realise the amount of time and effort goes in to wingers in training. That me, per, we had full sessions for kicking and catching. Yeah, like, yep. that, you know, Sometimes they might go an hour before we would rock up an hour before everyone else, mm. and we would literally just be catching for an hour over yep. and over and over. Yep. Um, me personally, whenever I got under a bomb, I would you say to myself because like sometimes I feel like when I see a winger drop a ball. It's because they're thinking about everything that's going on. Oh, yes. what's the kick chase doing? Am yes. I about to get smashed? Am, is the crowd... <laughs> what's going on? I used to say to myself... <laughs> I used to say to myself, you're going to get smashed? Yes. It doesn't matter. Yep. And then it would just take that out of my, my mind of like, okay, you've got to be willing to... Like, yeah. in my debut, I remember there was a... When I scored a try on my debut, it was a kick return try. And it was a, it was a chip over the top. Mm-hmm. And it bounced in like that no man's yep. land. yep. Yep. And basically, so you got to commit yourself. You, exactly. And so before I started running, I said, I don't care if I get knocked out. I'm not changing my line. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it worked for me. And I think, like, I think some of the, like, that's something that wingers, you can like, kind of get in your head. You say, take out of your head what possibly could happen, like getting knocked out mm. or whatever, mm. and just think of the ball. Yeah. Um, it sounds simple, but I think Wonga Blake, as if he plays winger more often, I think he'll. He'll uh, slowly uh, get better at that. Yeah. Uh, in regards to the Eels' performance, the second half completion rate was yeah. just unacceptable. Yeah. Unacceptable in a finals game. What did you feel of the second half of the Eels? Yeah, and, and that's that's partly due. Like sometimes you just you got to have a look at the opposition as well, can't be like you can't just mm. go, oh look, yeah, you know, geez, they were bad. The Eels. Mm. Sometimes you got to look at the opposition. And go, they were very good. Yeah. Like they were very good. Like they just they did all the little things really well. And again, we go back to the kicking. Like they were kicked to death. Mm. Like the the difference in the kicking games was was you know they, they were poles apart, particularly when Moses left the field. Mm, um, that's a good point. And so what they did was they were just constantly under pressure, constantly under pressure. And so what pressure does? Pressure brings mistakes mm. more times than not in those high in the in those high pressure games like semifinals and a, and a, a game like that one, a qualifying final to, to put yourself into a prelim. It brings pressure because you go searching. You go mm. searching outside of your game plan. You go searching for things that you, you haven't practiced all week. Um, and that's when errors occur. So they had a low completion rate and they were just under the pump the entire time. So, yeah, you know, oh, geez, for Eels fans, I'd like to see them bounce back. Like, Imagine being an Eels fan and they go out straight sets. Oh, Straight sets. <laughs> oh, mate. We'll get, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to it in the preview because yeah. there's a lot to talk about in regards to, you know, what are the ramifications? Because mm. they have to make a prelim. Like, yeah. They have to because yeah. well, they mate, on, they've, they've been kicked across to the other side. They yep. should beat the Raiders. And that's not like the Raiders are going great. Yeah. But the Eels are a premiership, you know. Yeah. Well, we're, like we're talking about, you know, some of the things that didn't do so well and, and whatnot. But three guys I, I wanted to give a rap to, though, Kempi and... Um, oh, we speak about these guys a lot, so you, you might agree. But Regan Campbell-Gillard, yeah. again, fantastic. Junior Bolo. And I thought um, Ryan Madison was strong yes, as well. Absolutely. Like they, the, the amount of work and, and a lot of the tough carries that they had were just, you know, like they, they tried their absolute hearts out for um, the Eels last weekend. And, and, you know, they were coming up against a very good forward pack in, in Penrith too, like full of representative players. Mm. R- RCG at the moment for mine, like he'd be he'd be... If not, he'd be equal form front row of the competition. Mm. You know, with like a James Fisher Harris and Tarpane. You, yeah, Tarpane, Um you, you, you know, you'd probably throw you know the Lodge um, Hargreaves combination in there as well. But those those guys are gone. There's no 
there's no secret as to why these teams are still a part of finals. Mm. It's because they've all got their big boys, their, their starting props are all in good form. Mm. You know, so like people tend to look at, oh, the fullback and, you know, the, the halfback and they're all, you know, they're the, they're the key players. Look back on a lot of premierships won by teams over however many years you want to go back and you look at the, their starting props and the form they take into that final series, more times than not, they'll be, you know, the best props in the comp. Mm, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I agree. In regards to RCG and even the, the, pen, uh, the Eels forward pack, if you go back and watch that game, the Eels forward pack, in my opinion, won the first half and they, put, they won the field position and you only win field position with two things, kicking and your forward pack, usually. Now, obviously, sometimes a game has changed and wingers can get you there, but it's mainly the forward pack and I thought the forward pack, especially in the first half, yeah. were absolutely outstanding for the Eels. It's just about the 80-minute performance for me with the Eels. If they can get that same uh, discipline for 80 minutes, mm. they can really... I mean, look, it was 7-6. Like, it was 7-6 seven, seven, right, going they were, half they were time. There. Yeah. We've got a call here. We've got a call from Ben. Ben, you there, mate? Yeah, mate. Gotcha. How you going? How you going, fellas? Very good, thank you. Yeah, good. Hey, just about the um, just about the whole bunker situation and on field, why don't the NRL look into um, adding two more touch judges? So there's two on each side. One can control the the defence. One can control the attack. Um, and then between the five officials, they can kind of look over everything from every angle. Oh, it's a tough one because I see what you mean because then we think that if we put more people in, they'll be able to catch more. But And look, I know Touchies have got a tough job, but even the ones we've got there, like they're literally watching the... Tr- like you can you can see the replay and they're watching what's happening and they don't make the call. So I don't know whether adding more of that would just... I don't know if it would confuse the ref on... You know what I mean? Because then he's got, to, he's got to listen to four different yeah. voices. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, Benny, I get what you're saying, mate. Like, there's more people out there, so there's more eyes on on the play and whatnot. But I think it just it probably adds a, a little bit more confusion um, to what's happening out there already, and and more voices into the ears of the referees. So, look, I think that yeah, you know, the game's been played for over a hundred years with two touch judges, um, and it seemed to work. So, um, the thing that a lot of people are questioning is um, the bunker and whether they should have as much involvement. And I'm, I'm for reducing the involvement that they have just to try scored. So reviewing, just bringing the bunker in to review tries. If, if the touch judges and the referee on field are unsure whether the try was scored or not, or whether it's a legitimate try, that's when you can bring the bunker in. And obviously, you know, while we still have the captain's challenge, um, it goes up to get reviewed. But yeah, I think, I think let's just stay with the two touchies, um, the one referee on the field, and, and maybe look to reduce the amount of um, times that the bunker gets involved in the game. Yeah, but then even that would like clean up forward passes and um, like the defence line a bit, you know what I mean? Because like, at the moment, I feel like forward passes are happening a fair bit. Yeah. Um, well, the the, the difficult the yeah the, yeah it's a difficult one with the forward passes, mate. Because the ruling in our game is that if like because balls can float, they can they can travel forward even when they're out of your hands backwards. So I don't know. It's a really it's a really difficult one on that. And and the, there's been talk around our game about trying to introduce like technology where they can identify forward passes where you know and I don't know how they can come up with that, but yeah, it's still a difficult one. There's always one touchy. If you, if you look at the game closely, there should be one touch judge in line with the attack, so in line with the ball, and then one touch judge in line with the defence. So they're keeping a, an eye on the defensive line and helping the referee with onside, offside, and one touch judge in line with the ball to um, try and identify you know forward passes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, that's fair. Awesome. Thanks. No, that's all good, fellas. Good on you, Benny. Thanks, for call, Ben. Appreciate it. Um, I mean, he's right in regards to sometimes I'm watching going, wow, how was that missed when we got, you know, two touches <laughs> looking at it? Well, you know um, what, you know what, Kempi? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why it's missed, because they know there's a bunker there now. Yeah, and so they just true. get involved. So mm. they just go, oh, look, oh, I don't know. Go upstairs. Mm. Yeah, just rely on the bunker. Yeah, they just go upstairs Offload and they'll, they'll check everything. They'll go back 400 plays before <laughs> and they'll check everything and then go, right oh, back down here, yep. boys. Boom. Um, <laughs> now, we've got another call. Reese, you there, mate? Hey boys, how you going? Reese, how are ya? Good, good, good. You got me. Got you, brother. What do you got? 
Um, look, I think Rugby World Cup or Rugby League World Cup coming up. I think we're going to see a change of the guard at half back, obviously, with Cleary taking Penrith probably to another grand final, and I think DCE will be moved over. I've got another one. Changing of the guard at fullback. Do we see Latrell play number one? Instead of Teddy. Look, I'm a massive Latrell fan. I, you know, I cannot sing his praises high enough. But Teddy is absolutely incredible. He's already one of the greatest fullbacks of all time. And if, if you go and actually look at his stats before he got head high, I think it was like 20 minutes in, he'd already run for like 110 meters or something. Um, so I, I like I agree in regards to Latrell has been outstanding since his return. But I don't think anyone's taken Teddy's spot until he gives it up. He is that good. Mm. No, I agree. I think I think Latrell, I think Latrell goes over if he if he feels as though his body's up to it and he can go over and and play that tour and have a, a shortened preseason. We, he he might decide not to and be like a Calvin Ponger and say, look, I want to focus on getting my body right, have a decent preseason, get ready for next year. We we don't know yet, have we? He hasn't announced anything, has he? No, Latrell. But if he goes, no, I agree. I think I think Tedesco will definitely be the one. Um, you just have to look at his origin series. I think he just picked up the Brad Fittler medal. Um, yeah, I think he won every award. Again, every award. Just every award. They handed out about 12 awards. He won all of them at the New South the, Wales Rugby League Awards. There was one player invited. There was one player invited. <laughs> it was Teddy. They didn't go and no one else went. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> but I think, um, uh, yeah, back to your question, Reese. Yeah, look, I, I think that Tedesco, he'll be the one. Um, I think there's even talk that he'll be given the captaincy for the Kangaroos on this tour. So... If if Daly Cherry Evans is is not there, um, if Latrell goes, um, if he's fit and, and he's and he's willing to go over and tour, like he'll be in the team, and I I think he'll go straight into the centres. Mm. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, lads. On your right, receipts for the call, on you, mate. Um, he, I mean, he's absolutely right in regards to Latrell's form. He has been absolutely on fire. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, me personally, selfishly, I love seeing Latrell at centre in a good side because he is just an absolute nightmare on yeah. the edge there. Uh, now, we've got some text here. Uh, boys, thoughts on the sin binning of Tracy for Val Holmes tackle? I thought it was a penalty try, but no sin bin. If we don't get down to 12 players, I believe we win. Sharky from Nara. Thoughts, Smithy? Um, no, look, I think it was a legitimate sin binning. There's no, there's no doubt that Connor Tracy tackled or, or even just touched um, Val Holmes, which affected his opportunity to to take the ball cleanly and score a try. I think if, if put it this way, if Connor Tracy's not there, I strongly believe that Val Holmes scores a try. Mm. So, you know, that was that was deemed a um, foul play by Connor Tracy and he was put in the bin. The one thing I felt that was, um, I, I was a little bit unsure of was that the Cowboys opted to take the two points. In the end, in the end, it was a great play because yeah. Ta- Taumalolo ended up scoring with 15 seconds left on the clock, and then Val Holmes kicks the conversion after the siren to, to level it up at 30 all. But when they took that too, I thought, oh, geez, um, you know, you're still leaving yourself a converted try short. Mm. Would you just try? Would you try and go for the points now when you know they're they're down a man and you've um, got field position? But in the end, you know, it was it worked out for them. Um, it was a brave call, uh, but they backed themselves, and and that's that's the, that's the style of football that the Cowboys have been playing all year is that they've played com- with confidence. They've they've played backing themselves and backing each other um, and it paid off from this week. The Sharkies versus the Cowboys. Now, talk about it. this game had everything. It had drama. It had mental toughness. It had big hits. It had silky play. It, it had, you know, two Cinderella story teams that, that a lot of people didn't even expect to make the eight, let alone be second and third. How did you see this game playing out, Smithy? Well, it was a, it was a bit of a seesawing game wasn't it where um, it at early on it looked like the Sharks were on top and then the Cowboys would find their way back and then that seemed like they had a lot of momentum but then the Sharks were able to wrestle it back off them um, also and the crowd was I'll, I'll tell you what there was 12,000 there um, at uh, Points Bet Stadium at Cronulla on the weekend but it felt like 25,000 30,000 they were going absolutely mental particularly when the Sharkies boys were up and about and they were scoring tries and when Andrew Fafita got on the field, they all went, they all went nuts. But um, it, it, it was a very entertaining game of football. And this is what I was talking about at the start, mate, where we've seen very different games of football um, throughout the, the, the opening weekend of the finals. Um, 
the concern I have for both of these sides is that they each conceded 30 mm. points. Mm. That That's the thing. And, and some... And, some of the tries that were scored, yeah, in the manner in which they were scored were, I, I think they'd be a few alarm bells, particularly for Craig Fitzgibbon, who, you know, his team are playing this weekend. So they got a short preparation. At least the Cowboys, you know, Todd Payton goes away. They do their review. I think the Cowboys actually were given two or three days off when mm. they returned to Townsville. I think they might only just be, they only just started training yesterday. Um, so it's given them at least and their coaching staff a, a few days to you know look at their match closely and go right this is the things that we we weren't great at we need to fix them and I think they'll be looking at it defensively whereas I'm talking about the Sharkies they got a, a much shorter preparation they've only got the sort of seven days and so if you think back to the, some of the tries so like the Tom Dearden try mm. so they the Cronulla Sharkies they kicked downfield they had the wind behind them um, I think Scott Drinkwater brings the ball back. Play two, Tom Dearden gets to dummy half, and it looks like it was just going to be a regulation hit-up for Val Holmes. Val Holmes was making his way in from his left edge, and he was just going to have a hit-up. He picked the ball up. They had two markers ready to go. The two markers backed off. Tom Dearden come out, just showed the ball. Someone took a show, and he just, he just went straight through the middle of their defensive line. And then as he got through, he just pinned the ears and ran ran around Will Kennedy. Mm. And as he did that... I. I I, look, I was watching the, the Cronulla players and there was about three or four of them just with their hands in the air. So that would be... That's the concerning thing for me is that, like, they faced a, a cowboy side who were up and about and, and confident, as I said before the break, but now they go and play against a Rabbitohs side who have some of the best attack in the competition. Mm. They don't. They don't try and, you know get a quick dummy half run and try to run through the middle of you. They actually, they're happy to attack your set defensive line and they'll pull you apart mm. with their, with their lines that they run and the timing and, you know, the crispness of their passes, particularly when the ball's getting in and around Cody Walker. We all know he's got lovely hands and his combination with Luttrell. That's the thing that where I think the alarm bells would be ringing for Craig Fitzgibbon and the Sharkies is that, Hey, we've conceded 32 against the Cowboys now we've got to face some of the best attacking um, talent in the competition with the, with the Rabbitohs. Do, do you think that they need to... Because you don't want to be changing defensive systems now because it's, it, you're so far into the season, it's worked for you really well. But when you look at the Dearden try, you look at the Taumalolo try, that's all about spacing around the ruck. Mm. And do you go into this game going, you know what, maybe we need to tighten our, our spacing up a little bit and, and basically say to Rabbitohs, look, if you're going to score, it's going to be around us rather than through us. Yeah. Well, they're just adjustments. And, and they need to be, as I said, they need to be made quickly. Like, you don't go changing your entire defensive system because, like, to their credit, they've been one of the strongest defensive sides in the comp, the Sharkies. Mm. It's, it's, it's where they've made a lot of improvement throughout the season. But what I was saying was some of the tries that they conceded on the weekend, they were just they, that, that's just not up to finals defense. Mm. That, that's not going to cut it come week two, week three. And even if they are lucky enough to get to a grand final, that's just it won't be good enough. So, you yeah. know, like they face, they face the Rabbitohs this week. If they, if they progress through Kempe, but they then face Penrith. Oh, my God. Who, again, are just, they're a team that are very patient, um, and they they wait for their time to strike, and and they pick you apart. So you need to be on. Like I think a lot of their preparation this week will be. I'm t I'm saying 75 percent defence, getting their defensive game in order to be able to compete against the Rabbitohs. And how do you see the Cowboys sitting? Because you know they also conceded that amount of points. Yet they've mm. gone through. Is it almost uh, a not a scary, but a worrying thing where they may go, well, we got the win, so it kind of paints over those cracks that may have appeared? Or well, what do you think they're going to do? Well, I'd like to think not. No, I'd like to think not. I think what the, the important thing for the Cowboys is to enjoy this victory and enjoy the week that they pre they've presented themselves with, with no game this weekend. They get to sit down and, as I said, you know, review that game closely because they do have a week off. There's no... There's no um, reason to sit down and you know start start planning for oh, okay if we play this team if we play that team hey let's just the thing you need to do is just get your own house in order mm. when you've got the week off let the game play out 
um, tomorrow night between uh, Parramatta and the Raiders. And by 10.30 tomorrow night, you'll know who you're playing and then you start planning for that particular opposition. So the first few training sessions of this week, I believe, will be just a chance for these players to freshen up a little bit, maybe put a little bit of work into them, mm. just to keep them keep the legs ticking over and so that they're ready to go. But certainly, I'd be looking at a, a, you know a couple of the things that they weren't so good at, um, and I'm sure Todd Payton um, would have mentioned, you know, conceding 30 points last week is it just it won't cut it next week. It mm. just it just will not cut it in a prelim. And you've had a bit to do with Scotty Drinkwater. You know, yeah. 11 tackle breaks, the match-winning play, and, you know, we spoke about it off air, the brilliance. You know, the game is on the line to send Nanai on a short line with Taumalolo in a tight block. Yeah. Scotty Drinkwater, what's it been like to see his development since, you know, going to the Cowboys? Well, it's fantastic, and, and I'm glad he's got the opportunity now to play in, in such a big match at home. It's, it's the first time that the Cowboys are going to be hosting a, a prelim final, a grand final qualifier. Um, so it's great for the, the club. It's great for the region. But for Scott Drinkwater, who, you know, he, he joined the Melbourne Storm as a young man and he and he really, um, he had to bide his time to even get a, an opportunity to play first grade, just one game because, he's, you know, he's loved playing fullback. I think he played mostly halves growing up, but he was never going to play in the halves or, or fullback at that starting spot at that point in time, given, you know, Cooper Cronk was there um, and Billy Slater playing at the back. <laughs> So it's, it was going to be a, a, tough. a tough job to try, and, to try and crack that. But he got a couple of opportunities when I think the boys may have been injured or playing representative football. And you could see he, was a, he, was a, you know, he had a lot of quality about him. Mm. And a lot, of, a lot of his quality in his game was, was things that weren't um, necessarily coached into him. Mm. They were, they were just, it was just natural ability that he had. Um, and then he had a... He had a string of injuries and one really unfortunate one where it looked like um, he was going to get the, the nod to play fullback um, for us when, when Billy Slater decided to retire. Mm. But he actually tore his pec. So he sat out nearly an entire season. Yeah, um, yeah. He then moved to the Cowboys. And so, so for, for me, um, having known Drinky for quite some time before he's moved to the Cowboys, it's great to see you know, a young guy get an opportunity like this. And he's made such a difference. Like he wasn't even in the t- he wasn't even in the team at the start of the year camping. Yeah, wow. You know what I mean? Like H- Hamaso Tabuai Fado was was the number one. Drinky was was not even in the side. I think he might have played off the bench a couple of games, and then sometimes he was like eighteenth man or something. Mm. And then it wasn't until the hammer picked up an injury. I think he might have picked up a leg injury or something, sort of a third of the way through the year, and then Drinky got in, and they've just he has not looked back at all. And he's been so good. Like I, I, I called that game, and I just I seen him working his way in, and I thought, well, if if the Cowboys are a chance here, Scott Drinkwater's got to get the ball in his hands, mm-hmm. and he'll create something. Whether he just whether he beats a couple of tackles and scores himself, or he's involved in a play, and he was. They put on that beautiful play that you just mentioned, where he had an option runner in um, Jeremiah and the Nye, um, and then I think Chad Townsend was out the back, and they just sort of they they hid Jason Taumalolo. Who played one of the most, you know, outs- you talk about Nathan Cleary and his performance. Oh. Like Tal Malolo, he Fire ran right. for 270 meters, made 40 tackles. Like he was pretty good. <laughs> he was pretty <laughs> Not good. Not bad. Not bad at all. And he scores with 15 seconds to go. You know, so they just they backed themselves. They didn't panic. They thought this is a play that we've practiced all week. We believe it'll work against this team. They put it on. He scores with 15 to go, and then Val Holmes does the rest. Mate, it was incredible. Just a quick shout out though. I think it was Cam McInnes. He nearly got he nearly got Tamalolo. It would yeah. have been one of the all time tackles. Yeah. Oh, again, like you know, and that's what finals are all about. Mm. Those big plays, you know, yeah. and you're putting everything on the line. And Cam McInnes, like he's he he is one of the unsung heroes of of that footy side this year. Um, mm. He's come back from a serious knee injury. Um, and he was again. He just he tried his absolute heart out on oh, the weekend for the Sharkies. Seriously. So. Watch, watch Cam McInnes to be in the thick of it again this weekend. Uh, look, we've got some text here, so we're going to get through them. Uh, speaking of bomb smithy, whose idea was it in origin to put up the bomb and absolutely annihilate Kurt Gibley <laughs> <laughs> at the back of one of my favourite origin memories, even though I'm a Blues fan? Oh, yeah, that was um, oh, that was unfortunate. No, so what happened was Steve Price got knocked out, and there was a little yeah. bit of happening. Someone ran over and grabbed him while he was knocked down the ground, and we didn't really think too much of uh, that uh, that incident, so... We kicked, we kicked it for touch, and it was like three seconds to go. The siren might have even gone. And we were like, what do you want to do? 
and and Lockie come over to me. He said, "Mate, just give it straight back to him." So I thought, "Oh, well, I'll just I'll put up like a bomb." But I think after the match, he said, "Nah, just I wanted you to just like chuck it to him, so then we could go and just hit <laughs> <laughs> hit someone that was like five meters away." <laughs> I ended up putting a bomb up, and it went down to p- poor Gids. Like oh, Kirk no. Gidley, mate, Gids is one of the most like best blokes you'll ever meet. He's a champion. Yeah. And uh, should have been in Queenslander, actually. Anyway, um, it went down to him, and like he just got swamped. He got swamped by the entire side. Like we got beaten. The, the Blues had had won. Like well, there was no yeah. way we could win the match. But yeah, it was mm. just a bit of a bit of a reaction for stick it up for your mates. Oh, poor old Pricey, he was knocked out. So yeah, that was that's, was the, that's, was what, that that's the, what happened. Was that the Ben Cray Hodjo incident? Yeah, no, I think it might have been. Yeah, yeah, Benny Cray come come in and give someone a little shove, <laughs> and then Hodjo went after him, and then. Benny he, Craig, was a... he chucked it in reverse real quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That origin moment was incredible. The D-lock, the great cyclone. Yeah. Lock yeah, game game, game 309. Well, I think we, we may have been looking for uh, a whitewash, but New South Wales, they played well and beat us. So, yeah, that's the way it ended. It was scenes, though. Scenes. Oh, absolute scenes. Now, we've got some more text here. Uh, Beak and Smithy, uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on Dragon signing Jacob Little. Do you think the writing is on the wall for McCulloch? Is it step in the right direction uh, for the Saints? Love the show. Keep it up from an optimistic Dragons fan. Uh, I'm not too sure if the writing's on the wall. I think maybe they're just bringing Jacob Little down there. He's a little bit younger than Andrew McCulloch. Um, I know Andrew McCulloch and and um, Anthony Griffin have a wonderful relationship. So I, I feel as though if if Hook, um, Anthony Griffin, the, as the coach of the Dragons, felt as though it was it was the best decision for Andrew McCulloch to finish. I'm sure that conversation would have been had by now. I'm sure of it. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one, mate, because there has been, like, reports coming out, you know, McCulloch considering retirement. And when I see that, sometimes I go, where's that coming from? You know, is he getting... Yeah. Uh, and look, no evidence for this. No. But sometimes it is the case. Like, is he getting pressured to, to move on? Or what, what's going on well, there? Well, sometimes... <laughs> You know, you'd like to think they're not pressured, but unfortunately, it's just it's just the, a part of the industry, Kempi, mm. where you know the the clubs are dealing with salary caps, you know, they're, and they're also dealing with you know fans and and sponsors and um, you know members that want results, and if they feel as though that something needs to be changed in their squad, and 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 sometimes, unfortunately. It's it's champion players like Andrew McCulloch who are getting on a little bit in their career. They feel as though that is the change that needs to be made. So if so if he's had a conversation with Anthony Griffin, he's certainly not the first person in rugby league history mm. to to be spoken to by the coach about you know maybe considering the thought of finishing their career. Mm. He's absolutely uh, he's absolutely not the first person that that would have happened to, mm, for sure. Um, so you'd rather that look. To be honest, Kempi, I would rather my coach come to me and say, "Hey, mate, listen, I think it's time for you to finish," mm. rather than play on and and be then forced to not be in the first grade side, maybe play out an entire season in reserve grade. You know, given what Andrew McCulloch has done in, like in career, like he's 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 a state of origin player. Yeah. You know, like, go out in a dignified way where it's it's on your terms and you go, right, okay, look, I've played over 300 matches, I've played State of Origin, I've played in Grand Finals. I think it's best that I move on. Yeah, I, I think it might be a little bit of a space to watch because if I recall, even when McCulloch came back from injury, I think Bud Sullivan actually started the maybe the last game or two, but that yeah. may be just to get some runs in the rookies but yeah. legs. Now, we're going to head to a break. After the break, we're going to continue, get to your text, and then after that... We got the massive review of the Storm versus the Raiders. We've got some text here. Uh, oh, Kempi, the last try was in the last 20 seconds against 12 men. Wasn't that great of a play? Jeez, guys, please. Sharky from now on. Ah, oh, the sorry, Sharky. Sharky. <laughs> I know you're hurting right now, mate. I know you're hurting. <laughs> uh, another text here. Hi, Dan and Cameron. Who has a better shot of beating Penrith next week? The Sharkies took them a full 80 minutes a couple of months ago, while South have an unorthodox attack. Latrell in clear career best form. Who do you think? Oh, well... Whoever wins will have the best chance. (laughs) That's what you come here for, guys. Deep, deep analysts from the great minds of rugby league. After the break, if you are Roosters or a Storm fan, text in because we are going to be reviewing the Storm versus Raiders game plus reviewing the Storm versus Roosters seasons. 
Welcome back to the Captain's Run with the great Cameron Smith. Make sure to download the SEN app or give us a follow at SEN League on Instagram or give us a text 0457 736 736 or call 1300 01 1170. Now, Smithy, I'm sorry, mate. We're going to have to talk about it. No, that's good. Um, I know it's going to hurt, but <laughs> fortunately for non-Melbourne fans, we finally have an opportunity to put the boot in. We finally <laughs> have the opportunity. So... Everyone, just enjoy the next, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes. Let's make it three Uh, minutes. (laughs) (laughs) So the Storm go down to the Raiders uh, at home. It's, uh, I think it is the first time since like 2003 or something, some long time, Mm. that both the Storm and the Roosters were knocked out and aren't a part of week uh, two of of the finals. Um, So the Storm go out to Raiders. Uh, I guess, what do you make of the match, mate? And uh, I guess the Storm as a whole. Well, I think, you know, if you listen to Craig Bellamy after the match, he was really disappointed with, um, you know, the the way the game finished and the way they played, particularly their defence. And and I think the term he used was, at times, soft as butter. So, you know, knowing the way he coaches and the way that he plans that footy side, it's it's, a lot of the game is based around defence. So, you know, just seeing a couple of the tries that the Raiders scored, they were... Fairly easy tries, um, you know, from an NRL standard point of view, and particularly finals. And we spoke about that with with uh, the the Sharkies against the Cowboys. So, watching that game, here, I thought, oh, geez, it's there was a few signs there where I thought oh, this is going to be a tough one. Um, and we just know that you just know that Canberra are a side that they know how to upset Melbourne. They just know, and I'm not. I, it's it's hard to pinpoint why. But they just—they've got a style of footy um, that they play, and they've—they've they've got this—they've got this sort of attitude about them that really gets under the skin of Melbourne players. Um, you know, they've done it for a long time, and I think they've got an outstanding result now. They've built an outstanding result at Amy Park. I think they've won the last five there, maybe Kempy. It's something yeah, like four or five, five matches. Yeah, five. Yep. yep. Um, you know, so that's. The disappointing thing for Melbourne, not just going out week one of the finals, it's the first time that they've been knocked out uh, week one of the finals since 2014. Wow. And you know what I mean? So, and, and I'm not trying to gloss over a loss, but if you look at their record since then, I think they, they've played in nearly from 2015 onwards till, till this year. I think they've, they've played in every prelim. That's so 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 2020 and 2021. But well, this is a footy side that they just they they make playing finals. That's just their business. Mm. So I think I think it was a bit of a shock for everyone to go. Wow, like the Storm, they're out. How good? Like <laughs> like you said, like most of the non-Storm supporters, they're like, yes, they're gone. <laughs> they're yep. gone. They can't they 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 can't create any sort of havoc in in the final now for my teams that are still in. But um, I, I think. You know, Craig was most disappointed, and you could see it on his face during the match and after the game. He was most disappointed with the way they finished because they were sending off four players that have done so much at that footy club. Now, Brandon Smith, he he spent the least amount of time at the Melbourne Storm um, out of the four of them. And when I say four, it's it's Brandon Smith, uh, Felice Cafusi, and the Bromwich boys, Kenny Bromwich and Jesse Bromwich. So the two Bromwich brothers, they joined the club in 2008 where they come in and played um, under-20s with the Melbourne Storm and progress their way through into first grade. All four of them are premiership players. And and I'm thinking that Craig, that's not the way he wanted them to finish their career at the Melbourne Storm. Mm. It it really wasn't. But but on the other side, you've got to give credit to the Raiders. They come down with a game plan that they just, as I said, they, uh, they, they, they upset the Storm rhythm. They, they found ways to score. They, they actually scored a couple of, you know, pretty decent tries. Um, and one sort of fortunistic one at the end there where it, it come off, was it Seb Chris? <laughs> come off Seb Chris. Noggin. Come off his melon. It was, a, it was a falcon, classic falcon. One of the best all time. Um, to to help them progress through. And, it come, and, and I'll tell you what, Fogarty had to come up with an amazing kick, mm. um, you know, at the end there to, to put them ahead by eight, which really sealed the deal for the result. But, um, yeah, they progress through. They find a way to to knock off the Melbourne Storm at home, which is a very hard thing to do. Yeah, look, we spoke about it last week, Smithy. It was almost like the one side out of the entire eight 
that Storm didn't want to play. I mean, again, there's no sides they don't want to play. But, mm. like, in reality, if there is one side that you were, if you were betting on, it would literally be the Raiders, and they're the ones that come eighth. It's, it's the Raiders that seem to have some... You know, I know Ricky and Belair are friends, but always there's just, like, com- there's a friendly competitiveness between them two. Oh, Very mate. competitive blokes. Yeah, they're... they're, they're let me tell you, they, they are good mates, but they're, they're not friends game day. No, Definitely not no friends way. game day. They, they are ultra competitive and they always want to get a win against each other. But yeah, Stick's got the, uh, he's got the wood over Belliac of, of recent times. Now, the, I, this is going to be, I guess, tough to talk about because, you know, you're an ex-Storm player and, and you know these boys. But, and this is not to be, you know, these guys, those four blokes have been incredible players, incredible players. But... The, the concern I had for Storm coming into this year was I just felt their forward pack's depth was a bit light. Yep. And then I also, as the year progressed, I just felt that maybe the explosiveness... And it's only natural as you get older. Yeah. The explosiveness compared to other packs, like a Tarpane, Papali'i, although he's getting older, he's still probably, I think, a little bit younger than some of the forwards there. Yep. Um, I just felt the young, youthful explosiveness of the Raiders may be too good for the storm is that something that you identified or what would you know was that the difference what did you feel the difference was between storm and the oh look i think um it's it's hard to sort of pinpoint just on that match i think when talking about the storm season the they had an injury list like they've never seen before Mm, Um, most in the comp yeah most in the comp so you know they're dealing with that and it wasn't just it wasn't just injuries to sort of you know a player that would be you know a fringe player in first grade or a guy that is just out there as one of your workers um, in the team, they were to guys that played in the key position. So, um, Ryan Pappenhausen, like, how many games did Paps play this year? Maybe 10? Yeah, and, he, and the ones that he did, he was absolutely incredible. Yeah, well, early on, like, a lot of people were talking about him playing for New South Wales this year. Mm. Um, mm. That's that's the form that he was in. So, he, so he, 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 he injured his hamstring and did his knee early in the year. He spent six weeks on the sideline, come back for a couple of games. And then that's when he um, smashed his kneecap, and that was it for him. That was that was game over for for his season. Um, Jerome Hughes spent time off the park. Cameron Munster t- spent time off the park. So did Brandon Smith. Harry Grant. Harry Grant played his full first full series of State of Origin, so he missed a few games as well. Um, and and look, th- these aren't excuses, but they were they were things that the team had to deal with that they haven't dealt with before. And then also trying to you know win matches with young guys, inexperienced guys, and an aging forward pack. Mm. Um, and look, yeah, I won't say that they didn't play well this year, but I thought for the most part they, they held their own against some of these younger guys. But you can see it's just a natural progression, isn't it? Mm. Particularly with the way the game's played now. It's very up-tempo, um, you know, with set restarts and all that sort of stuff. The younger guys with fresh legs... They're the guys that handle a lot better, and it's it's a it's a big reason why the North Queensland Cowboys are in the prelim. Yeah. Like you look at look have a look at their team across the park, particularly their forward pack. What well, Jason Tamalolo is the oldest guy in that forward pack, I think. Yeah. You know, you look at Griffin He's... Neem, you look at Tom Gilbert. Maybe um, McLean's the only other older one, but yeah, yeah, maybe Macca. Yeah, but he's missed a bit of footy, so he's probably yeah. fairly fresh. Um, yeah. Who else is there? Um, Reuben Cotter. You know, like they've just they've all got. Fr- you know, young, fresh legs. They're energetic. They haven't played a lot of football like the Bromwich boys and, and Felice Kafusi and, and these type of players. Um, but it's difficult. It's difficult being up for so long like the Melbourne Storm have um, to, to be at that level every week um, and, and finishing, you know, sort of in, in the last week, like playing a grand final or playing a prelim every year because teams are after you. Teams mm. are after you. And it's just, um, you know, I think, you know, Craig may have mentioned too in his post game stuff, like it it's 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 been something that's sort of building slowly um over the last couple of years for them. Now to the Raiders, uh what an incredible win for that club. I mean, they went the start of the season, I'm pretty sure, and I might be one game off, maximum one game off, but I think they went one and seven to open the season. Yeah, they did. And you know, <laughs> I spoke about it earlier on my podcast where Fogarty, the signing of Fogarty, mm. the negative impact that's had on the Titans and the positive impact oh, that's had on the Raiders wow. has been absolutely incredible. We even got a text here saying, how come Fogarty isn't being considered for signing of the year? Look, I wouldn't say he's signing of the year yet. Now, look, if they go on and win a comp, then you know, maybe <laughs> you, could, you could definitely look at it. But I tell you what, what I will say for sure is that 
he is definitely the most underrated signing of the year because ever since he's came back into this side, they're back in the end of their season. I think they went like seven wins and three losses. Like they were on a run. Right now they're on a run. I, th- I don't think they've lost in quite a few weeks. Yep. You know, with the Raiders, can they go all the way? Can they really do be the dark horse and do that? Well, absolutely. And yeah. like anything's possible. I think if you if going off the first weekend of the finals, everyone would be just saying, "Well, look, it's Penrith." And that's it. Like, who who else is going to beat Penrith? But you just don't know. You you do not know what's going to happen come grand final. And if Canberra can make their way through, well, they got to get through this week first when they're playing Parramatta. Plenty of storylines there, of course, with um, that Parramatta being Ricky Stewart's former club that he coached at. So there's no doubt there'll be a little bit of feeling involved in this one as well. Mm. But they they got to get through this week first and foremost. Then they got to play a prelim and worry about the other games afterwards. But Anyone on their day, and, and we mentioned this last week, w- when you get to finals, forget about what's happened during the year. Forget about it. It's done. It is done. It does not matter one bit because when you line up, when the eight teams line up week one of the finals, they are all back to square one. Mm. They are all back to even keel. They, they're, they're back on the start line. They're getting ready for that, you know, the last four weeks of the season. And whoever is the, the best team in the last month, they win the whole thing. It doesn't yeah. matter about minor premierships. It doesn't matter about your record you know, in, the, in the 25 rounds throughout the season. You just need to be the best team in the last month of footy. Now, Penrith and Cowboys, they've put themselves in a very good position where the, all they need to do is play one more game to be in a grand final. Yeah. They, got, they got the advantage of having a week off. They stay at home. They don't travel. There's none of that sort of stuff. But... That still doesn't guarantee them a spot in the grand final. You just do not know what's going to happen. Like, have a look at, have a look at the Roosters on the weekend. You tell me if yeah. you tell me if James Tedesco doesn't fail a HIA. What was it? Twenty minutes into the game. Yeah, about that. Like it may have been a very different story. Mm. So what's to say that you know when you when people think oh it's Penrith and that's it, let's say Penrith play a prelim and I'm not trying to at all put <laughs> any sort of um, put the mocker on Penrith here at all, but Let's say one of their key players gets knocked out in the early early exchanges mm. and fails a HIA yeah. and goes off the field and that's it. You just you do not know. It's not it's not like the the old game that we that we grew up watching where you cop a whack and just oh mate you'll be right stay out there we need you. No, that's it. Like there's independent doctors involved. Mm. So so many things can go into winning a premiership these days and a lot of it is luck. A lot of it is the amount of work you put in, the effort and the commitment to your game plan. But, you know, most certainly the Raiders, on their day, they could go all the way. Yeah. I mean, just quick, before we head to a break, just a quick shout-out to Ricky Stewart's ability to bring that team back together. They lost their main number nine in their captain, Hodgson, after a few minutes at the start of the season. They lost their halfback last year in uh, Georgie Williams. You know, these are key players in key positions. He decided to debut a young rookie fullback and replace Charles Nickel Hookstad, who took Mm. him to a grand final. Mm. You know, these are key, key. Jared Croker, he chose to play young rookie centres in Croker's position. Yep. These are big outs that a lot of other coaches wouldn't have been able to deal with. So quick shout out to Ricky for that. Now we've got a text. It's from Steve in St. Mary's. Steve-o. Good old Steve-o. St. Mary's, eh? Uh, Cameron, I'd love for the Storm to abandon the colour purple. I find it impossible to match any jeans, and my jean selection is extensive. Maybe a navy blue or a beige. That's from Steve. Thoughts on changing the colour, Smitty? Wow, Steve must be he must get around in the the purple storm jersey a fair bit. Um, no, I don't think. You, uh, well, the the storm is purple, right? So they're not going to change that. I, I suggest maybe Steve looks at maybe colour selection for his his jeans, his trousers, whatever it is. Maybe maybe like a light blue or even white. Yeah, I, you know what I've seen, Kempi. I've seen, I've seen when, like, in the, my years going over to the sort of North Shore playing against Manly. Yeah, I've actually seen a lot of that sort of combo that that purple lavender top with a maybe a white jean on, yeah. on guys over there, like in and around like the Collaroy Long Reef area. Yeah, I've seen it <laughs> yeah. a lot. So, yeah. Steve-O, maybe I, I know you're out at St Mary's area, out a bit west, but maybe go that combo, mate. Take it out west. Mate, I, uh, Steve, I don't know what you look like, mate, but I reckon you'd look damn fine in some white jeans. White. Tight too. Yep. Tight white. and white. Skinny. Um, white skinny, skinny jeans. Absolutely. <laughs> With the Storm jersey. Yes, Straight down absolutely. the pub. Absolutely. 
Send us a picture, picture if you want, Steve. Um, <laughs> now, let's get on to Roosters v. the Rabbitohs. Uh, look, <laughs> now, this is a really bizarre match because if you actually looked at the rugby league being played, you know... There wasn't the a lot mi- of it. Th- there wasn't a lot of it. <laughs> no. It, it went for about a 1,000 hours. Um, there were patches of some really, really good footy. But as a spectacle, this was absolute insanity. What did yeah. you think of Roosters Rabbitohs? Well, I, I sat down with the family actually on Sunday, jumped in the lounge room. I thought, let's let's just just lock ourselves in for this one. This is going to be outstanding. And the um, like, you got to take yourself back to Game Three of Origin this year to to even uh, match up any any game that's been played, particularly this year, to compare what happened between these two sides on Sunday afternoon, and even throw back to like nineties, throw back to the eighties. Mm. And a lot of our listeners, you know, wouldn't have watched watched a lot of football. We we certainly didn't through that time. I, I may have caught like the late eighties, Kempy, but um, it was it was physical. It was rough, and at times, as you said, it, w- there wasn't a lot of rugby league being played. <laughs> it was there was scuffles, there was pushing and shoving, there was head high tackles. Um, there was a few little melees here and there. Guys on the ground being attended to by trainers, the bunker looking at replays, and to be honest, a little bit into that second half, I thought, oh, I, I can't watch this anymore. I was mm. just, oh, come on, boys, let's just play footy. Mm. And and listening to the two coaches post game, that was that was really the message from from both coaches is that I'm sure they they would have preferred their teams to be just worry about their footy, and they said as they said as much afterwards, just saying, look. You know, I thought you know both both sides really they probably let the occasion get to them a little bit um, too much. You know, they they went away from playing footy, and in the end, I think Trent Robinson said that you know the Rabbitohs they just they handled the occasion a lot better than what his team did. I wonder whether Robbo, you know, because Robbo obviously an, an incredible coach, incredible coach, and everything he's achieved has been you know absolutely amazing, and he's still so young. Mm. But I wonder if he'll learn a lot from this game of because. You know, my understanding of watching the way Robbo coaches, he almost likes to create like warriors with discipline and aggression and toughness. And sometimes, you know, I feel like on the weekend, maybe that warrior spirit spirit got a bit of the best of some of the boys because they were refusing to let certain things go, you know, like Radley, Hargreaves, like let's say a Rabbitohs player gave one back to them, then they it just tit for tat. Mm. And I wonder if Robbo will take something into next season or like let's say they get into the finals next year. I wonder if, if his approach is just like tweaks it slightly to make sure that and again, let's be clear, I'm not just saying it was the Rabbitohs that let it get to him. I'm sorry, the Roosters. Mm. The Rabbitohs also let it get to him. I'm just saying yeah. it because the Roosters didn't get the win. Yep. Do you think that they tweak anything, you know, before games coming in the future or this was just a one-off where things got out of hand and, and it's just the way it is? Well, there's no doubt that you know, I think the players will learn just themselves from that um, experience of, of playing in that match and you look back on those games, Kempi you know that when you finish a game and you think oh look, I just I, I wasn't at my best why were the reasons for that? Um, and, you, and, you, and you try and find reasons, some, some stick out clearly, some others you've got to sort of search and, and sort of ask yourself a, a few deeper questions but I think, you know, listening to some comments out of the game um, from from those players was that they, they said, yeah, I, th- I think uh, Siwa Takiaho has come out and said, yeah, I'll, I'll let the occasion get the better of me mm. as far as the emotion of it all because he's moving on. He's going over to the English Super League. So um, sometimes, you know, sometimes emotion is great, okay? It, it's part of sport and, it, and it's what uh, makes, you know, things so interesting, particularly for the fans, is the emotional battle and the emotional, um, you know, commitment and, and part of sport. But on the m- most part, I, well, you know, from my point of view, i found throughout my career is that when you put the emotion aside and just worry about the football and go out there and get things done, you, you ex- go and execute your game plan, that's when things happen for you in, in a positive way. You know, there's no doubt that, that emotion, and, emotion plays a part in, in sport. But for me, I, I always found that if, if I if I just relied on emotion to get me through matches of football, particularly the big games, you know, that, they were some of the games that I, I, I wasn't at my best. Mm. When I knew exactly what needed to happen, 
I knew exactly what my role was. And, and no matter what happened during the game, whether there was a bit of a blow up and, you know, some pushes and shoves and things happened throughout the match, if, if I was able to get my mind quickly back onto the game, go back to the team and settle them down and say, hey, boys, let's get back to playing football, mm. more times than not, the result would go your way. Well, I mean, you only have to go back to your grand final win where, you know, you got the boys in a huddle after they were just, you know, offloading and, yeah. you, know, oh, yeah. you know, trying to live in the moment. What do you, do you remember, you know, what you said to the boys in the huddle and I guess to bring them back down to, I guess, well, that, I think I think you're referring to 2020. Yes, Is that right? Yeah, in like the yep. dying moments when uh, we, we lost, who did we lose? We, I think we lose Jerome Hughes. Cheese, I think. Was it Cheese yeah. went off as well? It was well? either Cheese, it was Cheese or Jerome that went first, either, either one. They both went off in the end, but we were down to 12 men, but we we were ahead and and we were ahead comfortably still with only you know maybe 3 minutes or 4 minutes to go on the clock so there was absolutely no need to be to be pushing passes or chancing our arm we weren't chasing points mm. we were ahead we were in a very strong position to just finish that game off so i remember grabbing the boys and just saying hey boys like we don't need to do that time and place have a look at the situation we're in. We're up by, I think we might have been up by 12, something like that. Um, and like, hey, boys, just take the tackle. Make, yeah. the, make, make our way down the field, kick the ball long, defend our set. That's all it was. And, and that's, it, sometimes you just need a bit of a reminder yeah. because the blood starts to pump a bit. You know, the atmosphere, the crowd are roaring. You know, Penrith, mm. are, Penrith are finding their way back. They're playing well. And sometimes that whole sort of, the, you know, the atmosphere and the emotion of it all, it gets the better of you. Mm. And your brain stops thinking yeah. about what, what's needed. Yes. You know what I mean? It's you, you're just acting on impulse. So sometimes when you just, hey, boys, you just hit the reset button and just go, hey, boys, look, this is, this is what we need to do. This is what needs to happen for the mm. you know, next little period of play. Let's get back to that. Get our game back on track. Yeah. Uh, look, it was an incredible spectacle. I, I, I enjoyed it as a spectacle, um, but I think both teams will learn a lot from that. I tell you what, it goes down in that rivalry book as one of the great get, like oh, one of the great. It goes in clashes. the book of feuds. Oh, mate, book of feuds, absolutely. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Now, Smitty, just a quick wrap up of the Storm Roosters season. Now, with the Storm, my I guess my personally looking at it from I guess trying to analyse next year for them. I just don't know what they're going to have in the forward pack. You've got Big Nelson. You've got guys like uh, Holworth coming through, who's a rookie, a, a much highly touted rookie. You've got mm-hmm. Tarek Sims. But I'm just trying to think, outside of that, uh, do you think they've recruited well enough or have they got people in the that are coming through that you're aware of that could step up next year? Well, they've always got a good talent pool as far as like their development players are concerned. And... Um... Jack Howarth, he's well. He just he was just resigned this year for a five. I think it was a five year extension. Wow, on some pretty big money, but he's cool. yet to play NRL. Um, so you know, I'm guessing if if they if they've committed themselves to to a young man um, for five years, mm. I'm guessing that he'll see some game time next year. Now he's a centre slash back rower, um, mm. so maybe that's that's somewhere um, or someone to to they look to. Long term, I guess, fill the void of um, a Kenny Bromwich or a Felice Cafusi. Trent Liero um, has played mm. a, f- a fair few games this year. Yeah, um, he debuted in twenty one, so last season. So I'm I'm thinking that yeah, he may go into that back row role as well. But yeah, it's it's more outside of Tarek Sims. Um, yeah, once again, the Melbourne Storm they haven't really re- recruited. Um, Experienced players, mm. they haven't recruited any sort of, um, you know, guys that have played, you know, let's say, 150 plus games, you know, played state of origin outside of Tarek Sims. So um, they got the young back rower from the Warriors, though, Katoa. I think it's Katoa. Yeah, um, that's who true. Is, who is going to be great? A already. very good player and 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 someone that was, you know, the Warriors were even talking about, you know his debut season and how good he went. So maybe he slips into that starting back row role. Um, mm. that, that those that Kenny Bromwich and both um, both he and Felice Cafusi has, uh, have opened up. But there's no doubt this is going to be a, a challenging season coming up in 23 for the Storm. Um, they still don't know what Cameron Munster is doing. 
Um, yep. The longer that drags on, oh, I feel as though, you know, the Storm will be <laughs> more concerned with whether he stays or not. So be very interesting to see what happens um, and, and how their season goes. Like, let's just say after November 1, he announces he, he'll be joining the – well, let's not just say – let's not say the Dolphins. Let's just say he's, he's moving elsewhere. Mm. What does that do to their season? Does that create disruption? I hope mm. not because, you know, he's, he's already said that he's committed to Melbourne for 23 um, and he can go on and play his best footy. Maybe, maybe that – maybe a decision either way, um, you know, whether, he, whether it's he stays at Storm or moves on. That just eases his mind a little bit. It eases everyone else's mind, and they just get on with their business in in twenty twenty three. Another big reason, you know, you want the Munster stuff done sooner rather than later is it's it's it puts pressure on your cap because if you know you've got a million dollars to go into the market, you can start making some phone calls now for two thousand and twenty four, yeah, and give yourself the best chance to recruit a big big signing. So, mm. um, yeah, agreed in regards to uh big year for the storm. Yeah, but and, and there's no doubt like the, the club has dealt with um you know some changes across you know the last four or five seasons at that at that club and a lot of um experienced guys have have moved on and they've handled it well. Um but yeah, losing someone or or people a group of people like the Bromwich boys and Kafusi and you throw in Brandon Smith like he yeah. is, he is a he is a one of a kind style of player. Absolutely, there's no other player in this competition that plays the way he does, mm. and can do the things he does. Mm. So now they're going to have to find. Well, I, I don't think they'll look for someone that plays like he does, but what they will have to do is 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 find, you know, multiple people that will provide the energy, the explosiveness. The, the game breaking abilities that Brandon Smith had for that footy club for a long for you know several years. Now speaking of Brandon Smith, he'll be going to the Roosters. It's really interesting the Roosters are in a strange position because last year with all the injuries, they almost came out of the year everyone going, Wow, there's a premiership next year. Look, they finished fifth and they had all of their stars injured. Imagine what they can do with a full strength side. Now they finished this year and they actually get bounced out first week. How do you see the Roosters going next year? Are they still, you know, re- you know, in that window for premiership, or where do you see them? Well, again, it's another club with a couple of changes, and like there's always changes in in every club um, throughout the competition. But they were they were someone at the start of the year where I, I was thinking, like you were talking about that aging forward pack, Kempi. Mm. I had similar thoughts about the Roosters. You know, Jared Weir, yeah. Hargreaves, um, Siwa Takiahu, who, who we know is is moving on. Um, but they they actually they started to play some of their best football at the back end of the year. Yeah. Now I covered a couple of the Roosters games at, at the start of the year in the first sort of month to, to six weeks, and I was speaking with Trent Robinson and a couple of their their players, um, and they they mentioned to me how they had a very disrupted preseason. Now mm-hmm. you you cannot underestimate the 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 value of having a really big preseason. It's it's yeah. what it's what uh, you know my entire career at Melbourne Storm was built on with Craig Bellamy and he said like if you want to have a good season you need to have a, a good preseason. that's where it all starts the work at, at the end of um, in the last couple of months of the year you know you have your Christmas break and then you and then you build again for another you know 10 weeks before the start of the season it's so crucial so like when you're talking I was talking with um, you know Trent Robinson he said you know we had disruption with um, you know, COVID, we had disruption with injuries. Um, a few players um, were spent time away from training because um, their partners gave birth to children. Mm. Um, so, you know, it was very disrupted. And Luke Keery, I think, he he hardly trained with with the team. You know, he was doing his own stuff, you know, doing some recovery work and, and whatnot, getting back into, um, you know, his running and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So... Um, you could see in the back end when they actually started spending a little bit of time together on the field, you could see the cohesion and the combinations building, and that's when they started playing their, their best football. And what they win? Eight in a row? They won eight in a row. Yeah. So they're a, they're a footy side and a footy club that, that they're always looking to, you know, um, be better, um, you know, 
Trent Robinson himself, he's always looking to be better. He will he'll would have learned lessons from this year as well. They're, they're much like the Melbourne Storm. I've never been a part of the Roosters, but talking to people within that organisation, I believe that's what that club is like and that's what the coach is like. So if it starts like that at the top, the players will be the same. So until we, we get a look at their, their roster next year, um, going into 2023 season, you would not say that you know, their opportunities next year to win a premiership are gone. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with Cameron Smith. Thanks to the SCN app. Download it anytime for free at the App Store and you can listen to it anywhere. Uh, let's take a look at the remaining hookers in the NRL finals and break down their games. We've got Appy Corris out, 23 games, 4 tries, 12 try assists, 13 line break assists, and he averages 41 tackles a game. Rhys Robson, he's got 7 tries, 7 try assists, uh, and 42 tackles a game. Then we've got Blake Braley, 4 tries, 9 try assists, 9 line break assists, 43 tackles a game. Reese, uh, Mar- uh, Reed Marnie, he's got eight tries, six try assists, uh, and a line break assist, and he averages 42 tackles. you got Cookie with eight tries, seven try assists, and ten line break assists. Then you got Wolford with zero tries, eight try assists, fine line break assists, and 22 tackles uh, average per game. Now, Smitty, out of these five, out of these six hookers, who do you feel has had the, the best year? Um, well, it's a difficult one because they're all, when you look at their stats that you just read out there, like they're all pretty well matched up against each other, uh, very similar. Um, Zach Wolford, he's the least experienced of the lot, um, made his debut this season and he's only played the 16 games, but I was really impressed with him on the weekend uh, against Melbourne. I just thought he, he's got a little bit of mongrel in him, a lot like his old man did, Simon, mm. and um, he just he got he got him off to a really good start. He got himself in front of you know the big boys like Jesse Bromwich and Nelson and Sofa Solomona, and um, he just he didn't take a backward step. And, and what he did, he he doesn't overplay his hand at dummy half. So he gets an opportunity to run. He'll have a little scoot and have a little scamper, have a look at the defensive line. But for the most part, he just he delivers a really nice pass to the guys that you know to his forwards running onto the ball. He gives. You know, guys like Papali'i and Tarpane early early football to let them do their thing, and then he you know and then he gives great service to the halves when they need the football. So um, really impressed with Zach Wolford and his start on the weekend. I think out of those six though, I'd probably say Reese Robson. Mm. Yeah, I reckon I'd lean towards Reese Robson. I think he's been outstanding for the Cowboys this year. Um, another young man who's played a, you know he played a little bit of football before going up to the Cowboys. I just think he's made such a difference there, and he, you, know, you think over the last what last year, um, you know, he's playing that sort of tandem role with Jake Granville. Some games he'd start, some games he'd come off the bench. I just think his form, um, and he must have had a huge preseason. Um, you know, talking about preseasons earlier, but he must have just put himself in a position where Todd Payton just said, like, I, I can't not pick him. Mm. I can't not pick him at nine. He's playing that well. So, you know, on top of his, his, you know, he's got great service from Dummy Harvey. He's got a really nice pass on him. He's a great runner of the football. The, the first time on the weekend, I was doing a little bit of work on the sideline pre-game, Kempi. Mm. It's the first time I've see, seen him up close. Mm. And, mate, he is a little nugget. Is he? He is a little nugget. He's a thick little fella. So it shows why he's so hard <laughs> to bring down and, and why, he's, why he's able to run. He's got a good running game. Um, you know, he's averaging, you know, 75 metres per game. On top of that, he's making plenty of tackles, as most dummy halves do, but you know, it's it's hard to overlook some of these guys. Like Api Corusau, again, he's played 23 matches. He's played Origin this year. The Panthers, they were by far the best team throughout the regular season, and look as though they're, they're in the box seat to go into another grand final, so he's played great. Blake Braley, another young man at, at the Sharks, I think he's been integral to their season and, and along with Nico Hines I think it's and, and Matt Moylan of course I think he's been great Reed Marnie's played strong again yeah, Damien Cook like he had a slow start to the year didn't he Damien Cook everyone yeah. was saying like he's not running like he probably shouldn't be picked for origin but he come good around that origin period and he's really mm. played a lot of great footy um, it's hard to single one out but if I had to it'd be Reese Robson Reese Robson out of those final six at least Mm. There's 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 a lot of there's a lot of good dummy halves that aren't in that final six. I have to mention Harry Grant. Like when you when you stack up his stats and and, and look, oh. cl- like put it this like clearly stats aren't the be all and end all because if they were, Harry Grant Harry Grant's got the great the the best stats out of any dummy half in the comp. But he's not playing. He's not in the last 
three weeks of the competition. You know what I mean? Yeah. Stats aren't everything. But if I can read his stats out compared to the, those six left, he played 19 matches, scored six tries, 16 try assists, Holy. 15 line break assists, and averaged 92 metres and 40 tackles a game. So... You know, he he was heavily involved in that in that storm lineup, particularly with their attack this year, and he created a lot of opportunities, a lot of opportunities with points. Um, that was just a special mention outside of that. But but I guess the one thing that does show Kempi is that stats aren't the be all and end all. They're yeah. a, they're a good guide, but it doesn't mean that 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 makes you necessarily the best nine in the game, or it's going to help your team win a premiership. Yeah, Reece, oh, I agree. I totally agree. And, and like, just quickly on the Reese Robson thing, really interesting because he was also battling Cotter for the nine position. Cotter has played a bit of nine himself. Yeah. And he, he pushed Cotter into that 13 role or 13 slash front row role. And it's been an absolute masterstroke uh, for both players. Yep. Uh, you know, so, yeah, Reese Robson, for me, his improvement. Last year watching him play, I was like, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to kick on. He had a lot of raps coming through. Obviously, at the Dragons, they let him go. I think he played Aussie schoolboys coming through, and he used to basically battle uh, uh, Blake Braley, um, yes. you know, uh, through schoolboys. But I, we're really getting sport for talent when it comes to nines. But let's get to the business, Smitty. The Eels versus the Raiders, 750, Combank Stadium. Mitchell Moses has been named despite the suffering a concussion and will be monitored throughout the week. And then we've got the Canberra Raiders uh, with Adam Elliott. He'll miss the game due to a pelvic injury. Corey Hutterweir and I replaces him in the starting side with Ryan Sutton joining the bench. I tell you what, that's not a bad replacement. Not bad at all. Now, we have to ask the key question, I think, for the whole match, Smithy. How will Mitch Moses recover after his concussion last week against the Panthers? And can the Eels win unless he's at 100%? Oh, look, I don't know. It, it makes it much harder, doesn't it, um, mm. if Mitch Moses isn't there? And we've seen the effects of his absence in the second half last week against Penrith um, their kicking game was it just it was all at sea when he wasn't there and he's their main kicker he, he, he would kick I reckon 95% of their kicks and it's surprising like does Dylan Brown not have a kick does he not have a kicking game I thought I thought he actually kicked the ball okay but yeah same um, yeah it, it look it, it, it makes the the the, the it, it makes the, the the way to go out and play well and, and win um, for Parramatta, much more difficult um, if he's not there. He, he's another guy that, you know, and you say this a lot, a lot about um, all the number sevens in the competition, but um, a lot of the game is based around him. Mm. And in in the big matches, if you don't have a, a strong kicker, um, it it makes it makes it a lot harder to to get to build pressure and and to get in positions to actually you know score points against the opposition. Um, but we've seen pictures this week of him out in the trading paddock, and I think I've I've heard him talk already about you know like there's some things there's some protocols that need to happen throughout the week, and there's some there's some maybe a, another test that he needs to pass to get through. But things are looking positive for himself, um, so I think he'll line up. I think he'll line up and play um, against the Raiders. But again, this is this is. This is a Raiders side who are just in fantastic form. They've got a lot of belief. There's, there is nothing to lose for this footy side. And, and Ricky, Ricky come out and said it after they beat the Storm is that there's no pressure on them because there's no expectation. You know, people, people believe this footy side after the first you know two months of the the competition that they were no chance. They were no chance to play for finals, so why would they be a chance to win the premiership? So they're just they're going to go out and play that way and have that same mindset. It's it's almost like in this like Goldilocks zone where you've got belief and also happiness. And what I mean by that is that they can go out and enjoy their footy, like because there's no pressure. So you, you you've yeah. got this like crazy amount of belief, but also you've got this like look, boys, we can just just enjoy it, like because if we get bounced out, so. People thought we were going to battle for the bottom four at the yeah. middle of the year. Yeah. Um, on top of all that, they've got scalps on their record. They've beaten the Sharkies. They've beaten the Storm a couple of times. Um, you know, they weren't absolutely dominated by the Panthers. Like, obviously, they lost, but they weren't completely out of it. So, I agree, mate. I think the Raiders are in a very, like, 
again, it's like a Goldilocks zone between pressure and, ha- and enjoying your footy. Sometimes, you know, teams can go out, and if there's too much pressure, they they forget to have fun. And it sounds yeah. so, you know, cliche, like have fun playing footy, but mm. sometimes it becomes a bit of a job instead of it being re- realising that I'm actually enjoying every minute of being on this field. Yeah. And I think the I think for Parramatta, like I know they had a, a loss last week, but they were playing against a good footy side and they played really well, Penrith. They 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 need to have the same approach. Like it's everyone knows the situation. It's do or die now. So you can't afford to go into this match, you know, you know, tentative or second guessing yourself or, or worrying about the result. The result will take care of itself if you go out there with the right attitude and play well. That That's the mindset they need to have. Like, just have an understanding and acknowledge that, hey, boys, this is it for us now. Mm. Okay? The second chance is gone. Well, sorry. Yeah, it's gone because we use, we've we used it up. We, we lost. Now we're playing again. We're still in it. The mindset needs to be, what does our best football look like? And let's go and get that done. Mm. Each and every one of us play our role in in that game plan that, that helps us play the way we did when we beat Penrith twice, we beat Melbourne twice. Um, they are they are the, the giant killers of this competition. So everyone knows that the Parramatta's got it in them. It's just a matter of them executing that on game day and not letting expectation of others, like, get to them. Because, mm. like, what's, what's the talk been about Parramatta for the last, what, five years, Kempi? Like, they need to win a premiership. They need to win a premiership. This is their chance. They've got the squad. Well, this is the last time this squad will play together. Mm -hmm. So, boys, go and make the most of it. Speaking of that, Smithy, it's going to sound harsh, but is Brad Arthur under pressure if they get bounced out two games in a row? Well, well, look, I, I think... Well, is he under pressure internally? We don't know that. He certainly will be externally. Mm. There's, oh, I think, I think the the question marks will be raised. Mm. So if they go, if they go, lost, lost, gone, I think the questions will come for for his job and whether he's the best person for that footy club moving forward. But in saying that, <laughs> who's, who's better? Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> that, you know what I mean? We're quick, we're quick to point the finger and say, "Oh, mate, he's no good." There's another failed season. Let's like get rid of him. Well, okay, who are you going to replace him with? Yeah, and who's going to make the squad coming in for 2023 perform better than what Brad Arthur did? Like, they finished fourth. They got a top four spot. They're in week two of the finals. Like, in in eight other clubs' minds, they'd be pretty happy to finish where they finished. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, you know what I mean. But and, and you know, but that that's a, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it because, you know. Of course, teams like the Dogs and West Tigers and the Warriors, teams like this would say, yeah, we'd swap them. We'd be happy with that. But, you know, this is, this is you're looking at a squad here with Parramatta that they've put together and they put a lot of time and effort into that should be, should be challenging for a premiership. Yeah, I agree, mate. And I think that, you know, it's also the people, look, the Raiders, don't get me wrong. I think they really are a dark horse and they absolutely on their day can beat any team. Yep. But if you said at the start of the year, the Eels have to beat the Raiders to get into a prelim, and they don't, you would say that's outrageously... Um, <laughs> that's a that poor performance. Happen. That should never happen. Like, yeah. if everything's on the line and you get to meet up against the Raiders, second week of the finals to get into a prelim, and the, se- the team that the Eels have on paper, and again, the Raiders have proven they can take it to anyone, but yeah. when you're looking at it on paper and you look at the forward pack and then you look at the backs... In no world should anyone be satisfied if the Eels lose on this weekend. Like, in no world is coming fourth and then losing both games. Now, mm. look, the Penrith... Like, put it this way. If they played Penrith and then they played the Melbourne Storm and they lost those games, I think a lot of people could say, look, they just got up against two absolute giants of the competition. Yep. But the loss to Penrith, okay, yep, disappointing. But then if you go on to lose... Like, when you look at the Eels' run right now, they have to beat the Raiders and the Cowboys and they're in a grand final. That anything less than that is is almost it shouldn't happen really. Yeah. Well, given their like I said, given the quality of of their roster, like the lineup, their best lineup is as good as any in the competition. When you like um, pound for pound, when you when you're watching the the team list, mm. um, 
But sometimes that that just doesn't transfer to strong performances. Yeah. And this team, unfortunately, has a history of not coming up in the big games. Mm. So that you know they're able to beat the the best sides throughout the regular seasons, but in in the in the big games when it counts, they falter. So they just need to work out a way to try and get through. They just need to worry about the next eighty minutes. Yeah. Okay. Don't worry about two weeks' time when the grand final yep. is on and and trying to win a premiership. <laughs> worry about beating the Raiders first, mm. and 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 work out a strategy and a way to do that, and to give yourself an opportunity to go out and play your best football. Each and every one of them have to do that. It's just if you don't, if if you if you have twelve good players, thirteen good players, and you carry four players that don't play well, then more than likely you won't win the match. Yeah, that's just how finals work. Yeah, it's uh, the Eels, and for that reason, I think the Eels get the job done. I think that they're playing for so much more than just a finals win. They're playing for pressure on everyone. Mm. Like you I mean, you could even begin looking at, at Mitch. I know Mitch is, I actually think he's really put himself, you know, he's improved so, so much over the last few years. He's become one of the most consistent players, one of the most consistent sevens in the last couple of years. I, I'd honestly put him at least in the top four or five yeah. in regards to consistency. But, I, you know, you, you start you start having to look at the leaders in that club and saying, boys, do you have what it takes to make a prelim at mm. least, mm. at the minimum? Um, and, and, I don't, and to be clear, I think they do have what it takes. And that's why I think that They'll get the job done on the weekend because they're playing for so, so much on the weekend. Um, how, who, what about the Raiders? How do you do you see them getting up or do you see the Eels getting up? I actually give them a chance, Kempi. Yeah? Yeah, I really do. I really do. I think they take a lot of... Well, they've been com- they've been playing with a lot of confidence anyway. Um, and as you said, they've got this um, no expectation um, on them style attitude that they're taking into this game. I think we mentioned earlier in the show, I think Josh Papali'i and Joseph Tarpany are in just a really, really good touch. Great matchup between the two props um, mm. on on either side. Um, RCG up against Josh Papali'i, oh. Junior Bolo up against Joseph Tarpany. It's just, um, you know, you even look to the back rowers like Sean Lane versus Hudson Young, Isaiah Papali'i versus Elliot Whitehead. Just, it's a great matchup. Um, in that forward pack, so maybe, maybe you look at those forwards and just go right. Well, who's going to win that battle early? That mm. may that may give you know one team an advantage going into half time, and um, do they hold on in the second half? I don't know. I just, I think they just that attitude that they take in where like no one's got any expectation on us to do anything here compared to Parramatta. They've got all expectation on them. Yeah, and you know, does that pressure get to them? I don't know. Maybe, maybe after coming up against Penrith last week, and a lot of people were saying, "Well, this, this is their match. They can knock them off, mm. right?" Maybe after losing that one, they just go right. The like, the weight's off the shoulders, the shackles are off. They just go play their football. Mm. Um, but out of these two matches, I see on the weekend, I think this one's probably toss of the coin for me. Yeah, it really okay. is. Only, only given, only, only because of the lack of consistency from Parramatta mm. in in the big matches. That's the only reason. If if I knew they were going to go out and play their best football, I'd, you'd back them. But I'm going to lean towards the Raiders in this one. Wow. Yep. Big call. I'm going to lean towards the Raiders. It might be the wrong call, but I'm I'm just going to lean towards them. Okay. Given their uh, their big win last week against Melbourne. And what do you think, you know, in regards to Raiders' game plan, if you were, you know, captaining the side, what what would your plan kind of be? Is there any areas that you think that the Eels can be beaten on? Or? Oh, I'd just, I'd go after, I'd I'd just say to my, my forwards, hey, boys, need a big game again. Need to go after Campbell Gillard and Junior Bollard. Need to just take them out of the match. Need to shut down their go forward. And then, and then it's their halves. Their halves and Gutho. Mm. So Clint Gutherson playing one, Brown and Moses, they are the key to this footy side. I'd just be like, hey, boys, when we're defending these guys, every time they get the ball, we need we need a green jersey at them and at them quickly. Yeah. Make them, make them feel uncomfortable all game. Don't allow them any time and space to make decisions. Mm. Don't, don't give them that opportunity. Because a lot of the players, like they've got wonderful – Individuals and athletic individuals like you know Wunga Blake, Will Penasini, um, Opacek, Mike Sivo in particular, 
when 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 those key players like I was talking about have time and and space and 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 time to sum up the best op- option to hit, like whether it be Wunga Blake or Sivo or you know one of the centers in Penasini or Opacek, those guys make you pay. Mm. So it's all about just taking time um, off off those those halves and, and Clint Gutherson. I think it goes a long way to winning the match. Do you think we're going to see a bit of uh, a, well, not a bit, a lot of bombs going towards Wonga Blake? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> if they're in position, if they're in position, it'll be the first kick that goes up. Yeah, I think Jack really Whiten, will. Jack Whiten will just sink his big left boot into it. He will kick it as high and as ugly a kick he can kick straight down Wonga Blake's throat. It's going to be, oh, man. It's uh, Wunga Blake, you know, he's just got to be focused. So, like, it's it's this really strange balance between thinking about it because yeah. you have to be aware it's going to come. Yeah. But also not thinking about it too much. Yeah. How many because... catches? How many catches do you reckon he took this week? <laughs> How many bombs has he still under, you reckon? Mate, he's probably still out there, seriously. <laughs> he, hasn't st- he hasn't he gone hasn't home. He hasn't gone home. home. He's honestly still oh, out there. The head noise oh, would be oh. absolutely incredible. Oh. Uh, in regards to the Eels, just quickly before we head to the break, where do you th- what do you think they need to do to, to beat the Raiders? Well, just, just get rid of all exterior noise, mate. Mm. Forget about the, the, the expectation of others. Or just they they need to think about themselves, and I know they they play tomorrow night. It's it's you know, but they would have finished their captain's run, and now by now, or they might just be wrapping up sort of around this time. So their preparation's done, but they they just need to get out there and just play. Don't worry about anyone else. Just they need to worry about themselves individually, and and think about how like what does our game look like when we're playing our best football, and what am I doing for the team when we're playing our best football. That's mm. what we need to do. And if they do that, like I said, if they all play their role as best they can and the team plays well, I feel as though they will win the match. Mm. But I just it's hard to do it given their inconsistencies. But from a Parramatta's point of view, forget about everyone else. Worry about what your role is on the night. Go and get that done as best you can. Welcome back to the Captain's Run. And it's time now for one of my favourite moments of the week. It's the Holy Schnitz brought to you by Schnitz. The best schnitzels in all the lands. Now, my nomination this week is the seven sin bins in the Roosters Rabbitohs match last week. Honestly, I thought I'd say holy schnitz once, but I said it seven times. Seven times. Absolutely incredible. It might be the record amount of times I said holy schnitz. Yep. What about yourself, Cam? Well, it was a record amount of sin bins, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So I reckon it would have been a record amount of sh- holy schnitz. Uh, yeah, my holy schnitz moment involved uh, the number seven as well. But it was the cool. number on the back of the player wearing it. Nathan Uh-oh. Cleary. Holy. Yep. Just his performance and his kicking game in particular. I think that's... I sat there and just went, holy schnitz. I wasn't like out of me seat, holy schnitz. I was just like, holy schnitz. Man, do you this reckon... This is incredible. Do you reckon Wonga Blake was he going, was holy, saying schnitz, holy schnitz, holy schnitz, holy schnitz, holy schnitz. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> he may have broke your record. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> For seven. <laughs> He did it seven times every time he got kicked the ball. Oh, oh wow. Blake, but uh, that was my nomination. And I reckon Tommy, where's Tommy? Tommy Wigan, where, surely Schnitz is on its way. Surely. He's not no. listening. No Our good. producer Tommy, he's, got, he's he just not even. He's uh, brushing us. He's yeah. brushed us. I, I guess All we're good. not getting it today. No, not today. We do thank the very lovely people at Schnitz, though. Uh, they were wraps out. and everything. Oh, beautiful. Oh, they're so good. Seriously. Stop talking about it, Smithy. I'm getting hungry. Uh... <laughs> They were our holy schnitz sporting moments, thanks to schnitz. Got that winning taste right now? Schnitz. Handcrafted schnitzels made fresh and made just for you. Welcome back to the Captain's Run with the great Cameron Smith. You can uh, download the SEN app. You can follow us at SEN League on Instagram. But also, you can uh, listen to us anytime on Apple and Spotify. But let's get to the cracking map. Honestly, the Sharkies versus the Rabbitohs. Mm. Now, this is seriously the one that I'm most unsure about, Smithy. I honestly don't know which way to lean. How do you see this match playing out, mate? You know what, mate? I'm, like, I'm opposite to last game. So you were, you're fairly confident that Parra are going to win. I was 50-50. Yep. I yep. lent towards the Raiders. Oh, I'm pretty certain the Rabbits win this one. Wow. Yeah, I, I think they do. And I, I do that. I, I make that assumption off the back of um, the games played in the weekend where they looked, they looked pretty silky. When they started playing footy, they looked pretty silky, particularly with the ball. Um, and they were able to score, you know, some pretty good points against the Roosters, who, you know, they're 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 quite a good side defensively. 
And then I looked at the Sharkies, and we mentioned this earlier in the show. They conceded 32. 32 points at home. Wow. And they're home dunghill. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so I think that's – that for me, I think that just points towards the Rabbitohs. Um, no Tom Burgess. He's, he's accepted a two-game ban um, for his high shot on James Tedesco. Uh, Michael Cheekham comes in to replace him on the bench. Uh, the Sharkies, they're unchanged. Um, from their lineup, with, uh, from their loss to the Cowboys, although Dale Finucane, he escaped with a three thousand dollar fine um, with a crusher tackle. Um, yeah, I, I think, mate, I, I just think the Bunnies will be too good here. I okay. really do. I really think they'll be too good. Plus, when you think you think about the Sharks, now I know it was a very physical, um, it was a physical battle. The 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 Rabbitohs Roosters game, and you know a few of those boys will be sore, but you know it's just they've dealt with that all year. Think think about the Sharks, though. Yeah. They played a 93-minute match. Wow. 93 minutes they played. You know, I wow. think Braley, Braley made something like 63 tackles. Yeah. So, you know, at some stage in this match, like they'll, they'll look or they'll be up for it early. But if, but if they have, if South can have um, a decent um, quality, if they can have some quality football and they have a fair share of the ball as far as their possession is concerned, I think you might see a few fatigued Sharkies players in the back end of this match. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm so excited, and this is actually our match of the round, and we do that thanks to SunCorp. Get your award-winning car insurance now with SunCorp. Uh, seven years in a row, seven years in a row. But let's get back to it. This is going to be the match of the round for us. Look, I, I absolutely see where you're coming from in regards to Sharkies, the 93-minute game, and yes, the South Sydney Rabbitohs. It was a brutal game, but. You know, I think the brutality was more, you know, a few head highs here and there. And, you know, they outside of Teddy um, and Tom Burgess, there wasn't really... And Tokiaha, but he came back on. There wasn't anyone that got... Sign- oh, Crichton, but he's not hits. playing. Significant head highs. So, yep. I agree in the regards to freshness. I don't know. I just... With the Sharkies, there's, I just feel like there's something about Fitzgibbon and the way I think he's going to be able to get the boys up for this match. And I think Nico Hines is just in such good touch... Oh, like I, there's I well, he, just he, well he was classy wasn't he Kempy? Yeah, like incredible. He, he and Moylan they put on some nice tries um, for the Sharkies in that loss, and and that's what I was saying. It was a bit of a seesaw game where they looked in control, and then the Cowboys mm. would score a couple, and then they looked like they were the team with all the momentum, and it took you know like to be fair, it took all the way up to the the last like it was after the siren when Val Holmes had to kick the uh, the conversion to take it into extra time. Yeah, I just, I still, I, I cannot, I cannot go past how they conceded so many. Oh well, there's no other way to put it. Soft tries mm. against the Cowboys, and now to look across the other side of the park this week, and you're looking at guys like Cody Walker, um, and Damian Cook, the man that starts at the ruck. You know, Tom Dearden made line breaks from dummy half. Imagine what Damien Cook can do if, if if the Cronulla Sharks' middles aren't on defensively. Mm. Um, you know, they're just... You know, and, and last week, I, I thought Lachlan Ilias was so, so good. Yeah. He was strong. You know what I mean? He's like, really he, good. He, like he, the, the other guys take the take the, the spotlight, you know, Cody Walker and um, and Latrell Mitchell because of, you know, who they are and their, their profile, their standing in the game. But I thought Lachlan Ilias was so good last week. On on mm. both sides of the ball, so defence he was he was he was great. He was strong with the football. He had he had he made good choices with his passing game. He ran a couple of times. He had a great kicking game. I don't know. I just I just feel as though that these guys are taking in a fair bit of momentum into the match, and that their attack like if if they get their attack on and they hold the ball, um, I feel as though that they just win. Just straightforward win for them. Wow. It's, uh, look, I, the thing with the Sharkies that I do like is that, you know, <clears throat> although they leak that many points, I just feel I love their mental toughness in that game. Like, they, they yeah. just refuse to break. You know, it would be... There were a lot of... As you said, it was, a, it was a back and forth game, and I feel like there were a lot of moments where either side between the Cowboys and the Sharkies could have just said, you know what, we've lost momentum. Yeah, we're done. The but I just... What I loved about it was this toughness of, like... Till the dying seconds, they didn't um, break. And yes, they leaked as that a lot of points, which is definitely not a good thing. But 
you know, if if uh, they don't have a man go to the bin, do they get the win? I'm not sure. Mm. I, I I'm really un- I'm going to go. Th- I'm going to stick with the Sharkies, just because I've already said that oh, I'm going with the Sharkies. Yeah. Um, now, where where do you think the Sharkies? Let's say the Sharkies can get a win. How would you, as a leader of that team, how would you get the win if you were playing? For well, them? I actually I actually spoke about this in in the call during the game, and I felt as though when they went away from their direct hard running, and and their sets where it, they looked organised. Okay, they looked mm. they looked organised. They knew exactly where they needed to be on every tackle. That's that's when they looked their most dangerous. It's when they looked their most um, content playing that way. I think when they get into this style of footy where people go off, they go a little bit when each of their players, they may go a little bit rogue and go, oh, look, I've got space over here and I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll run 20 metres cross field and then I'll try and dig in here and then, oh, actually, I've got an arm free. I'll try and throw that one out the, out the back door. Mm. The next person thinks, well, I'll do the same. I'll go cross field. I'll try and beat a couple of tackles and then I'll get an offload. I think that's when it gets a little bit messy for them. Okay. I think if they stick to their, if they stick to their their game plans, and they play, they play a style of fully where they just they go run hard, run hard, and it's not it's not just one out runs. Mm. Like I mean, when when say you know Nico Hines or Matt Moylan, they get the ball off Brayley, they take a few steps forward, take their big forwards onto the ball, get them over the advantage line, and you know let's just say you know one of their big forwards. Yeah, you know, digs into the line like a Toby Rudolph, who started the game fantastic. Oh, he man. and Royce what about Hunt. About a try. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Like he and Royce Hunt were great. Like the, the, when they when they looked their most dangerous was when guys just they just ran straight and hard into space, and and they had intent, they had purpose about what they were doing. Mm. When they went a little bit sort of, you know, like I said, when they went a little bit rogue and thought, oh, I'll just, oh, I can see something over here. I'll try and I'll try and do something over there. That's when they they got out of their structures and they just they they started making mistakes. Mm. Um, I think you know Matty Moylan more so you know he he doesn't mind playing that little sort of off the cuff football, but I think Nico Hines in particular, his his strong suit is you know making sure that he's giving direction to the team at where they need to be. Hey boys, take two rucks that way. We're coming back with this play. Then we'll take a play here and then I'll kick. Mm. That's when he's at his best. Yeah. So I think for the for the Sharkies, that's what they need to stick to. They need to stick to a disciplined, a disciplined, eighty minute football this week for them, uh, for them to have a chance to win. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because when you look at it, it's Hines is essentially not essentially it's his first year as a seven leading a team around. Yeah. And so you know maybe that is their Achilles heel is the fact that he doesn't have experience like. Look, let's be clear. In my opinion, he's the Dally M of the year. I think he should get it. Yep. But maybe that's the small part of his game that he just doesn't have the pull yet to force players to go. When I say to do something, yeah. you do it. Well, off the back of off the back of his season, Kempy, like they they should have that that um, trust in him mm. to say, well, okay, he's our number seven. He's our general. If he if he says, hey boys, this is what we need to do, you, you go and do it. Mm. That's 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 what makes good footy sides. Is that everyone understanding their role in the football team like everyone's not the the playmaker every player is not the man that's going to have the final pass to send someone across the try line sometimes mm. your role is hey boy hey just get the ball and go forward for me mm. go and make 8 meters for me get down on the ground get up and play the ball as quick as you can mm. build some momentum for the footy side get some field position for us and we'll go do the rest mm. so i think they need to if you look across the season, and you know, Kempe, you're saying that Nico Hines is your Dally M Player of the Year. If he's played that well, surely his teammates are looking at him, going, "You know what? I'll just I'm going to do what this bloke tells me to do because positive things will happen if I do it." Mm. It's really interesting in regards to you know, you play, people might think, "Well, of course you would listen to the half," but you'd be surprised how many people get a rush of blood. And they think, oh, oh, there's a hole there. I can make a line break. And they they're thinking about themselves. I it recalls a top like Wayne Bennett used to always go. I don't care how many meters you get in kick returns. You need to get me to the middle of the field. Yeah. yeah there would be times where people would go like, here's a good example. Is like sometimes Darius would crab across the field, and people would say like, Darbs, why why is Darius crabbing across the field like that and not you know running directly into the edges where there's a bit of space? Yep. And it was all about. You know, okay, maybe you don't get the raps because as a winger, you're you're doing what the coach says, but mm. the coach notices that, and so does the half, because now the half is in the middle of the field 
returning the ball. It's so much easier to get out of your own end, and it yep. just kind of furthers the point in regards to your Sharks uh, analysis. Yeah. Well, that's right. It's just, it's all about, it's it's not about personal glory or anything like that. Like, it's 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 about team. Like they're, it, they're playing a team sport, so do what's needed for the team. You What you try and do is play your role so that it allows other players in the team to bring their strengths to the side as well. Mm. Don't just go out, don't just go out on this, like, limb and try and do it all yourself because it's not how the game works. Mm. You need to, you need to be able to complement each other to help each other play the best team game you can because if you do that then you're a really good chance of winning. And just quickly on the Rabbitohs, uh Cody Walker has just all of us not all well I guess, I guess all of a sudden hit incredible form. Four tries on the weekend and one of the tries yeah. to win the game, the skill to hold it that extra second and yeah. throw it after the decision has been made. Uh, do you think that, you know, is Cody going to hit enough form to get into another grand final? Well, I think he can. Like, he certainly can. Like, he showed last year, you know, with the run that they had in the back half of the year that he can do that. And he's showing signs of that once once more. And that's that's why I'm saying South win is because they've got, they've got a couple of players there that can just really tear teams apart. Mm. They can. They, they can just... You can have a set defensive line... When you watch the Rabbitohs play, it doesn't matter who they're playing. Mm. And you go, oh, here they go. They're lining up out to the left. And look at the opposition. They're like, they got, they got numbers that match up. They got good defensive spacings. They're ready to go. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, Alex Johnston's putting it down in the corner like a training run. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, like a training. It's like they're yeah. jogging and the, the defense can't do anything about it. They put under this spell mm. where they just, they start heading in field, trying to take men inside. And then all of a sudden they got a two man overlap. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, I, I think, um, did Jason Demetrio come out and said he's a, he's a generational player? Yeah, with, wow. with the way that he, with his ball playing, mm. with his ball playing ability and the hands that he has, you know, the soft touch that he has and his ability to hold up the ball to that last moment, as you mentioned, mm. when a defender has made a decision, then he goes, right, I'm going to go that pass out the back now. If he plays that way, then, uh, you know, I just, I, I think they can score a fair few points this weekend. Bennett actually said that he would be in his all-time 17 last year. Cody Walker. Yeah, really? if, I recall, if I recall correctly, wow, Bennett said he'd be in his all-time 17. Call. He yeah, when he was Cody. on that run. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, uh, we've just had some breaking news. New Zealand have released their widest squad. Uh, they've, re- I think they've named about 34 players around that. Um, mm. We were just talking off-air about you know potential Smokies for Australia. So quickly, Smithy, is do you think Hudson Young is a Smokie for Australia? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Would you pick him? Oh, I think I think he'll go as a tourer, yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah, well, oh, well oh, I shouldn't say there's no doubt, but he's put himself in that frame, hasn't he? Mm. To go over as maybe an extra player, extra forward. He's he's a type of guy that's quite versatile, can play a couple of different positions. You need that in those these tournament-style events. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, in regards to the teams, just looking at this New Zealand squad, Strong. would you say, would you say that this is the potentially the first year Australia aren't outright favourites? Well, I think, I don't think, are they going into it as favourites? I don't know. They're, 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 well, as we know, they're, they're not ranked number one going into it. New Zealand mm. are. They're actually ranked fourth yeah, in wow. the world at the moment, the Kangaroos. But, you know, just if, if we toss out a few of these names here that New Zealand have named, um, Soph Solomon the two Bromwich brothers, Dylan Brown, Fisher Harris, Kieran Foran, of course, in great form, Hamlin, Hamlin Ueli, uh, Jerome Hughes, Sebastian Chris, um, yet to play for New Zealand, so he's been added. Moses Leota, Joseph Manu, um, like this is this is a strong strong squad. Um, Ronaldo Militalo's there. Griffin Griffin Neem, uh, oh. from the Cowboys. Um, Britton Nakora, um, Marada Nakora, Isaiah Papali'i, Jordan Rapana, like. You, names go on like Brandon Smith, Scott Sorensen. He'll he'll definitely be a player that goes in that squad. Has to Scott Sorensen. Like he's been fantastic for Penrith this year. Um, Joseph Tarpney, Matthew Tomoko. Uh, it, it is a great lineup. A great Smitty, lineup. I'm going to tell you the odds right now, okay. and it's going to this might blow your mind. Okay. Australia are paying a dollar forty. New Zealand are play, paying five dollars fifty. Really. That's cr- $1. value. A dollar forty. That is value for Winks. me if it comes to New Zealand. Seriously. Well, I'll tell you what, and I reckon the, the reason why those odds are where they're at um, is because 
traditionally, like when you look at New Zealand in the tournament setups, they haven't done well away from mm. home, particularly away from home when they go over to England. Um, they've done, they've they've obviously got some results down here when they play sort of um, Southern Hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand style tournaments. They won the 2008 World Cup. I think they won they won the Four Nations in uh, 2014 as well. Um, you know, so they they do well here close to home, but maybe those prices are because of going overseas. But I'll tell you what, that I, I reckon those prices need to come in. Having a look yeah. at that squad, they've they've got a very very strong squad. I agree. Definitely got to come in for sure. Five fifty. Wow, compared to a dollar forty. Welcome back to the captain's run with the great Cameron Smith. Now, just before we end the show, Smithy, let's go over the tips. Who have you got for game one? Game one, I am going to go. Oh, well, you said who? Para. I said Para. I'm leaning towards Raiders. Wow. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. The green call. machine. The green machine. The milk. Getting behind the milk. <laughs> the milk. <laughs> <laughs> now, game two. Who are you going? Uh, I'm going south here. Outright wow. outright win south. Wow. Big, big call. Yes. The only time will tell. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in, guys. Make sure to download the app at any time. You can subscribe to us, Apple and Spotify. But most of all, make sure to give at SEN League a follow on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week. See you next week.